Movie buff specialist Phil and John are back, and we are continuing our way through our favorite 100 movies of all time. Today we're talking about number 43, which is Gladiator for myself and Throne of Blood for John. Uh, Ridley Scott, Akira Kurosawa. John looked like he wanted to jump in very quickly there. John, what 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 did I say wrong? No, I think I just disconnected there quick briefly, oh, okay. and there was a bit of a stutter, and I was very concerned. Oh, okay, good, good, good. Okay, well, I don't feel as concerned now. Uh, John, I think you had this, I think you had Gladiator at number 89 on your top 100, so was on your top 100, but a little mm -hmm. bit further down. Um, I have it almost, you know, twice as high on my list as you do. This is the first time I ever saw Throne of Blood, so that was a good, that was a good watch. Um, I feel like I'm starting to see a little bit more Kurosawa, maybe at a different time in my life and starting to appreciate it a little bit more. Um, but we'll see. This will be an interesting discussion. Both movies that kind of deal with like, you know, hierarchy and society uh, mm -hmm. in like a very old school, ancient stance. So I think that that's a, that's an interesting dynamic. Although one is a uh, adaptation, kind of loose adaptation of Shakespeare. Um, I understand a lot of the plot points and stuff, but like, I think what's so nice about Throne of Blood is it doesn't have those Shakespeare language like yes. at all. Yes. And then um, Gladiator, not based on a true story, uh, but certainly sometimes feels like it. And uh, Maximus is just so much fun to watch. Um, but we're going to start with Throne of Blood. And this time I'm actually going to start yeah. with Throne of Blood. I promise everybody I'm going to start with the movie I say I'm going to start with because I was just which, listening to last week's podcast. And man, I have no idea still how I ended up talking about Almost Famous first or Shawshank first, whatever I did. We're going to talk about Throne of Blood first from 1957, Akira Kurosawa. I have seen a lot of 1957 movies in the last two years now, and I have enjoyed almost every single one of them. It is quickly becoming one of my favorite years for movies of all time. John, why would you throw it on your list, and uh, what what is it about this one that resonates so much more with you than his other work? Well, I wouldn't say it resonates with me more than his other work. I would just say it was the only Kurosawa I had watched at this point when I made my list. Because I've really? watched a lot of more Kurosawa <laughs> since then. Uh, but upon making my list, I, I watched Throne of Blood years ago mm -hmm. for the first time while I was taking a course on film adaptations of Shakespeare. And I immediately fell in love with it. I couldn't believe how well it showed the versatility of Shakespeare. And yeah. how this is one of the best things about Shakespeare is the fact that you can take a Shakespeare play set it in any time period, and it's still relevant. Mm -hmm. And Kurosawa does that with what I think is the best adaptation of a Shakespeare play ever. I, I think I agree with you. I'm having a hard time thinking of another one. I know West Side Story is, a, is an adaptation, but mm -hmm. I really enjoyed this movie. Like, I really, really did. And what I liked about this one is it didn't have to be a musical. It totally got away from Shakespeare's language, which turns a lot of people off while it makes the super fans super fans you know it is what it is but yeah. it just was its own movie but set to Macbeth yeah. and I thought that was just so interesting to watch because we got to see this take place in an entirely different world than Shakespeare ever even saw he never saw Japan like he doesn't know what was going on in Japan at this time he had no idea mm -hmm. and so we got to see a completely different world but how relevant it was still to that society however we're seeing it in a very palatable way. And I think that's what sets this one apart. Because if you think about it, a lot of the time, like Hamlet, the Kenneth Branagh version, generally considered the best version of Hamlet. Mm -hmm. It looks amazing. What else do you really get from that movie other than it looks amazing? You go all the way back to the 1940s one. It doesn't look very good. That's it. That's it. It doesn't look very good. Simple enough. And then you have... Um, you know, West Side Story, which, you know, is a different type of adaptation. We've seen a lot of adaptations of Romeo and Juliet, so that's kind of hard. Um, but when it comes to Throne of Blood, it's it's giving it to you in a way where I've never been to Japan. I don't really know much about Japanese culture because I haven't really studied it and looked too much into it. And yet I could understand this whole movie. And it was a Shakespeare adaptation set in a land that I've never been. That's pretty good because most of the time, even though I'm pretty familiar with Romeo and Juliet at this point, there's some things where I'm like, I don't know what the hell they're talking about. And I'm just going to wait until this scene's over. Didn't have that happen to me once during Throne of Blood. Yeah, I think what's really impressive is that Akira Kurosawa just like perfectly encapsulates the Sengoku era of Japan and this idea of like this warring feudal states that were going on there and realized that it was analogous to the original setting of Macbeth and how it can perfectly translate over to it 
but still remain the same. When we're talking about like plot points, it's fairly similar. We still kind of have like the big Macbeth scenes in this. We have like uh, the witch's premonition, which in this place case mm -hmm. is replaced by a spirit, which totally makes way more sense based yeah. on where it's being set. We still kind of have like you know Duncan's death scene. We have um, like Duncan's death scene, but we don't get Macbeth's mm -hmm. like dagger soliloquy leading up to it, which is great. Mm -hmm. Uh, we get like um, the ghost at the feast. We get uh, Lady Macbeth washing her hands. We get all of these iconic scenes still, but it's just changed and Curse How it changes it slightly, just enough to make it make way more sense in this Japanese setting, and doesn't force any of those scenes to have to be beat for beat what Shakespeare originally wrote, and that's. It, it, that's really what sets us apart from other Shakespeare adaptations. Like you said, it diverts from the language, which is perfect because translating Shakespeare English <laughs> to Japanese and then like subbing that again would have been horrendous. I can mm -hmm. only imagine what that would be like. But by altering the story just enough so that it fits more what we're seeing in this movie, because we don't, my, one of my favorite parts about this is it gets rid of the stupid you can never be slorn by man bore of woman mm -hmm. loophole mm -hmm. in the original Macbeth. And I love Macbeth. Macbeth is one of my all-time favorite Shakespeare plays. But come on, the Caesarian section loophole is ridiculous. All right. I'm going to keep going off of this without getting into the Caesarian section loophole because I understand where you're coming from, but I don't know enough about Macbeth. I think I read it on accident. I don't even think we had to. So, um, but... I agree with everything else you said here. The spirit in this movie is terrifying. Like yes. downright terrifying. It's creepy as hell. It really works. I love like the spinning wheel, just sitting there, sitting there, sitting there. Like there is such an uneasiness to all of this. Enough so that you know this isn't a horror movie. You mm -hmm. know it's not, but you're still waiting for like something really bad to happen in a scary type of way. It's very unsettling. And I really like that. What I really loved about this though, is how short it is. Mm -hmm. So many Shakespeare adaptations get in the hands of a director who is just verbose. And that is all, they just want to go out there and stroke their ego and let you see that they can make a Shakespeare adaptation just like everybody else, but pretend that theirs is going to be some groundbreaking thing. How many times have we seen two and a half hour versions of Romeo and Juliet where it's the same exact thing that Baz Luhrmann did and that the guy who directed the first one did? And I can't think of his name. It was the Zeffirelli. Italian. Zeffirelli. Thank you. The Italian guy. I knew that. Um, this was short. It's an hour and 49 minutes. It flies mm -hmm. by. It really yep. does. And it bounces around between every important plot point very quickly. It gets you through each important character very quickly. and But it creates such a mood. And by not dragging it out, you don't lose that mood. You don't lose mm -hmm. that feel and you don't lose, um, you know, the interest in what is going on. That's what I think is so great about this movie. I gave it four stars. I That's the mm -hmm. first time I've ever given an Akira Kurosawa movie four stars. I am yeah. I haven't seen The Seven Samurai, so that's different. And I'll get there at some point. But like Rashomon, I didn't love it. I really didn't. Um, you know, Jimbo, didn't love it. Maybe I'll like them more now that I'm older. Ran... Mm -hmm. I appreciated it a lot more than I liked it. This movie, though, I said, this is a movie I will watch again. Yeah. And I will enjoy it when I watch again. And I will probably, if this is ever on, or if I'm just looking for a movie on Canopy or something like that, this is a movie I will put on. If this goes on the Criterion Collection sale that they do, where it's 50% off, this is a movie I would buy. Yeah. Like, I really, really enjoyed this. And, and just from, like, a filmmaking standpoint, the cinematography in this is outstanding. The direction is outstanding. And I think people forget this was made in 1957. They could have been using color. He could have done it different. And Kurosawa, I think, had made a color film by now. Maybe not, but I think he had. But either way, he could have. And he didn't. And he did it purposely. And he used it to his advantage. It's so well done. And I need to remind people that 1957, there is color in those movies. Because the movies that yeah. I like from there, The Cranes Are Flying, Wild <laughs> Strawberries, 12 Angry Men, and Now Throne of Blood. None of those movies have color. Somebody <laughs> yep. let them know that 1957, you were allowed to make movies in color. Yeah, uh, but I like it. I like this decision too. And Kurosawa is just such an auteur when he's making his movies. There's a lot of fog in this movie. 
a lot of fog. And I love the use of fog at the beginning. I love when we get like the signpost of here stood Spiderweb Castle. And then like the fog encloses over it and then like lifts and we actually have the castle. Kurosawa waited until there was actual fog encasing the set to film that. Like Kurosawa would sit there and on this mountain waiting for fog to come in and then lift to film any of these film these scenes with fog. He didn't use fog machines. He wanted this natural effect of fog lifting around his setting. And it's it's just this dedication to art that Kurosawa put in that really helps elevate this film above, I mean, a lot of Kurosawa films, but just a lot of films in general. Yeah, I was a huge fan of how um, how that worked in the beginning of this movie, like with the fog and everything and then the revealing. It's amazing. I guess it helps when you're shooting in the mountains of Japan, right? You're going to be yes. able to have a little bit more of the ability there. But I, I thought it was amazing to look at. I thought for sure there were fog machines. Yeah. Yeah, I did too. And then I happened to be looking at something yesterday that told me there were not. Uh, it's, it's incredible. And like, <clears throat> we're... <laughs> Even when we look at it, one of the big things with, like, the plot of Macbeth, I, disclaimer, I have taught Macbeth to students before, and it's because it is, like, just such an accessible Shakespeare play and easy to understand Shakespeare play. And, like, I've shown them Throne of Blood without telling them it was a Japanese movie. And even then, like, students who would not normally appreciate this type of movie love this movie. And a lot of it comes down to the fact that it really plays well with these major themes that we see in Macbeth. Uh, we get this idea of ambition, which is amplified in this. Because we, in the original Macbeth play, there is a lot of talk about masculinity versus femininity. And, like, um, the emasculation of Macbeth and how, like, Lady Macbeth pushes him to the murder. That's kind of pushed to the wayside in this one. Which is fine, because it, it just pushes forward the idea of ambition so much more. When we have uh, with Shizu, hearing that he's going to be this, um, like the leader of the 1st Battalion, and then, or the North Battalion, and then move up to be Lord of Spiderweb Castle, it's, it's this fascinating turn of events. And we just see it in him. And we see it in Lady Wishizu as well, as they're like, oh yes, we can push for this. We can make this happen. And it's that ambition that inevitably becomes their downfall. Yeah. And and I know like Lady Macbeth is like one of the most iconic characters from any Shakespeare play. I think what they did in this one is pretty interesting because she's not really in that much of it. Um, no. She has a smaller role than what she does in the actual like play. And in a lot of the stuff we'll end up seeing, you know, adaptations and stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's still very effective. And I think it also fits with the Japanese culture more mm -hmm. because the Japanese culture was a lot more focused on, um, you know, men first in a lot of instances. Right. So like the samurai and doing all that kind of thing, like that was, that was such a male heavy thing that I do think it really worked to have it go this way and focus more on Macbeth, but still how Lady Macbeth is the one who is ultimately kind of corrupting his mind as this is going on. Mm -hmm. And I think that leads into there's there's a great scene later where Miki's son is uh, talking to him and he says, um, the spirit has tricked you into fulfilling the prophecy. Now you believe it mm -hmm. is true. Mm -hmm. uh, and like this plays into another one of the major themes in Macbeth, this idea of like fate versus free will. Mm -hmm. And it's and like the equivocation of the spirit where he's like telling half truths is made in a way to make. Um, Moshizu and Miki fulfill these prophecies no matter what. And it seems like it's prophetic, but it's really them choosing to pursue this these ambitions that keeps this plot rolling. Mm -hmm. Sorry, hang on. I have to answer one thing. Keep going. Um, and then we also get this idea of like guilt. Guilt is a major theme in Macbeth as well. And it's obviously um, most exemplified in the scene where uh, Lady Macbeth washes her hands of the blood that's not there. And we, we still get that scene here. And it's almost more terrifying in this one. In, in the original play, it seemed more like this like weak moment of guilt like overcoming. 
in here, it looks like Lady Machise was just completely consumed by guilt. And I think it's exemplified by the fact that this pot has no water in it whatsoever. It, it's such yeah. a startling decision that just makes it so haunting. How does this work in the original one? There's water in it, right? And she just thinks it's blood? It, it depends on the interpretation of it. But for the most part, it's like she's actually washing blood off of her hands. Like, she thinks there's blood all over her hands and she can't get it off while washing. But usually there well, is what I'm saying is, like is there actually cabinet. anything on her hands at any in any no. of the other adaptations? No. no. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because I thought this scene was great. I really enjoyed how they put this one together and how it worked out. Um, like, I again, I think that they did a really good job with Lady Macbeth's role in this because it is smaller, but it's still having the same you know, issues going on. And I thought that scene was great because it just like, that's the point of no return scene and the reaction of all of the other women around her and everything like that, like, and setting it in black. It's like, what is terrifying them about this lady? Because mm -hmm. we already know she's a pretty imposing figure to a lot of people. What now has she done to terrify them? Um, I was, I was really into, I was really into that. I liked what they did with her throughout pretty much the whole movie, even in a smaller role. And I agree with you. That scene probably works as more terrifying. I'm trying to think of other Macbeth adaptations I've seen. And I honestly need to look up which one I've seen. Cause I know I've seen one, but I know I've only also seen one. So yeah. I'm going to look that up. Yeah. And one of the big changes we get, like I mentioned earlier, is that we don't have this, we don't have the Macduff character in, yes. in this version. Right. And I actually really appreciate that because instead, I, we still get the whole idea of like the trees moving from the forest and everything like that. But instead of Macduff coming in and like being the person to slay Macbeth, what we get in this version is Washizu tells all of his men, we can't lose as long as the trees don't attack us. And the trees can't attack. That, that's, that's ridiculous. It'll never happen. Yeah. And then, of course, like the opposing armies come like marching, bearing branches to like kind of conceal themselves. So at which point was Shizu's men turn on him? Mm -hmm. And that is such a better ending to this Macbeth story than the actual ending to Macbeth, in my opinion. Because what we see here is a man who is so ambitious, who was thought to be this like immortal leader, then be like, oh no, like these trees are coming to get us. And all of his men instantly turn on him. Mm -hmm. And then we get the beautiful scene of Toshiro Mifune just running along this set yeah. with arrows flying and like these are trained archers this was actually shooting arrows at Toshiro Mifune to now and every time he like waves his arms at the arrows is him indicating which direction he's running next so that they don't shoot him nah. <laughs> you, it, that's it, insane uh, so yeah <laughs> what about the ones he gets hit with I mean those are not intentionally hitting him. <laughs> those are those, those are like no. Yeah, those they're, are they're not hitting him. Yeah. Okay, good, 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 good. I'm just making he sure. He didn't actually get sure shot that... in his throat. I was gonna say, and that's why his uh, his career ended in 1957. Just so everybody knows, um, it definitely did not. <laughs> it definitely did not. No, I know he's he's a huge collaborator with Kurosawa. So yeah, he's in and, like everything. And, yes, and Toshiro Mifune, he just has to be said like Toshiro Mifune is just like this goat of samurai films and mm -hmm. Japanese cinema. He's absolutely incredible. And yes, he, he kind of gets like this, like really angry role a lot of the times, which like, mm -hmm. had, he had such a distinct so well. face. He did. Yeah. And he looked rugged and, compared to a lot of other Japanese actors at the time. Mm -hmm. And this, his performance in this is absolutely incredible. It goes all extents of the spectrum. We get like him being this kind of like wishy washy as he's thinking about killing the, um, the great lord and then we get like the conviction that he has towards the end and then we get like actual fear from him at the very end of this film mm -hmm. it, it's his range in this film and every film he's in is so vast that it just goes to show how good of an actor he is see i also was gonna say like i like that we get to see his fear in this movie because i feel like a lot of times in the shakespearean tragedies and in the adaptations we see we're so we see them so bravely facing death or like they're taking it under their own terms or like something like that. Like they're they're ready to face death. He clearly is not. 
And so to see him react in the way that he's reacting in this movie, I think really works because too often we'll see like, okay, they're going to die now and then they can face it with a brave face to see this character, not face it with a brave face at all really works. And, um, especially too, cause like in the samurai genre, even though I know this isn't like a samurai movie, it still has a very a similar movie. feel. Yeah, it is. <laughs> if you have Mifune and, and you're Kurosawa, it's a samurai movie, but yeah. to, to set it this way and to make it, you know, to have it play out the way it does, you very rarely ever see samurai characters panic. You almost yeah. never see it. And here we see it. And it's such an interesting, like, what is it? A uh, divergence from the normal way that these movies play out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and we get it at several different points. We, cause we also, we really, and Macbeth, we do see like fear a lot more because like the guilt encroaching on him a lot. And it's kind of like one of those major themes in Macbeth, but you're right. Like he's still like very arrogant. And a lot of the times in the portrayal of his <clears throat> final battle with Macduff, he, he still doesn't really have that fear where we truly see the fear of Macbeth uh, and we see it in Throne of Blood as well, is when the spirit of Miyuki appears in this movie. Mm -hmm. And I thought this is handled so well. It has that, like, kind of terrifying Japanese spirit of, like, the white spirit just, like, sitting there, like, looking like they're mouthing something, but they're not saying anything. Yep. It, it's such a ominous visual. The blank like, stares, man. Yeah, I, you just see it, and, like... If anyone saw that, they would freak out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the blank stares are great. Um, and and again, like how it's not going to be him whoever does anything. His fate will be worse and better, but his kid will ultimately take it. You know, be better. All that stuff really works. I um, you had brought this point up when I was distracted by my phone because of something, but um, I do like the whole question of this too. Of like, are you fulfilling the prophecy? that was laid out before you. And was that all part of this spirit's plans and things like that? And I think Shakespeare looks at that stuff a lot, but I also think that's what a lot of people look at. Like when they go to a, um, a fortune teller yeah. for lack of a better term, Oh, this is going to happen to you. Well, then they go and they seek out a way for that to happen. Okay. Was that going to happen? If the person ever told you now it's come true. And now you're going to say, Oh, you were right. Are you though? You know, like, so I do like this idea of had that never happened. Would they have pushed, would he have pushed and become as um, arrogant and everything as he does become? Probably not. But I, I love that it raises that question and kind of, you know, takes a, a look at that type of character. Yeah. And it's, it's the fact that it's like this preying on ambition to make it happen to, right? Like this, the character of Washizu or like Macbeth in the original, would they be as cocky? as they would be had this prophecy never happened, right? Yeah. Because presumably, based on the events that happened prior to the start of the film, she's just being promoted to a leader of the Northern Garrison no matter what. We, we see that at the very beginning of the film when the... I love the opening to Macbeth because we get... Before we even meet Mac, Macbeth at all, we have... Uh, these side characters kind of just discussing his his deeds. It sets up the character as like this noble character mm -hmm. who is this fantastic military tactician and leader. And it really sets the ground for everything to come. Normally I'm not a fan of like exposition dumps, but mm -hmm. in this case, it's really just building up this character so that we understand exactly where this character's at at the beginning when they're introduced and why they can fall prey to these premonitions well and i think what really works with this exposition dump is it's not just exposition of the character it's exposition mm -hmm. of the setting it's exposition like they're using on every level to let you know the time period what the stakes are where they are who the characters are who they're up against if they're winning or losing why this guy is rogue and it does it all in like three minutes it's yeah. all done in about three minutes. And then we meet this character on his way back after being successful. So now we know the stories are true about the success. And now what's going to end up happening. I think that when you can do it, same thing we talked about with Shawshank last week with uh voiceover. And we're going to talk about it next week because I have adaptation next and adaptation yeah. is massive in discussion about voiceover. And I think with this movie, 
It doesn't always work. Most of the time it doesn't when you have a heavy exposition dump. But sometimes you just get people who know how to do it. And it's like yeah. you can't tell me that Martin Scorsese movies would be better if they didn't have voiceover because they wouldn't be. Like Goodfellas is Goodfellas because it has voiceover. The Departed yeah. is The Departed because it has voiceover. So this works on a different level. There's a lot of people who just do exposition dumps to get the story moving. This is showing you who's in charge, who's coming in, who's losing, who's winning. How dire is this situation? And especially being set when it was, this would wipe out a population if you lost. Mm -hmm. And they had, what, four garrisons or something? Like they had four places yeah. in the North Garrison. So they had a lot of fortresses. And they were all getting taken until Mika and um, I can't think of his name. Ushizu. Stop. Ushizu. We're able to stop. And – make it all work out. And then that's of course why they start to take over. So yeah, I was a big fan of this movie. I, um, I was very pleasantly surprised and uh, I'm telling you 1957 people got to go look this up. It is insane. Uh, the year 12 angry men, the seventh seal paths of glory, wild strawberries, throne of blood bridge on the river, Kwai, Knights of Kiberia witness for the prosecution, sweet smell of success. The cranes are flying. That's ridiculous. Yeah. And that's like world cinema. Like that's all across. That's not just like American movies or we just, I mean, we have two of the best Bergman movies ever made that came out in the same year, the same year that a Kurosawa movie comes out. That's one of the best Kurosawa movies. It's insane. Yeah. It, it's just a wild year for cinema. And I, I feel like we're just getting to a point where people kind of forget how good of a year it was because they don't associate the, the movies together that came out that year. Yeah. Or we're just at a point where people don't like watching movies from, 65 well, years ago. <laughs> I think the biggest problem is other than 12 Angry Men, none of these movies are still in necessarily like the mainstream. True. 12 Angry Men is a movie that like pretty much everybody will watch at some point in their life, whether they're in like a writing class or mm -hmm. if you're in high school, they might show you that about like the judicial, the judicial system in America. Like who knows? There are so many reasons to watch that. But like Sweet Smell of Success, The Cranes Are Flying, those are movies that started to come to popularity because of Criterion releases. Yeah, And then you have movies like Paths of Glory, one of Kubrick's best, but most people aren't going to seek that one out because it doesn't show up on the top 100 list and things like that. Mm -hmm. Bergman, people just know is depressing, so they might not seek that out. And The Bridge on the River Kwai might be the most underrated American film ever made. But when you look at a war movie, that's not the movie you're going to. And yeah. so like when you look at American war films, that's not what you're going to because it's not really a war film. And so that's where it's a little bit tougher uh, to get people to watch these. But I mean, I didn't realize how good 57 was until last year. That's for yeah. sure. And now that I'm like in it, it's an insane. And I didn't even get into like a face in the crowd or uh, uh, what's the other one that came out there. There was one other one. The uh, Is that the original 310 EM? I think it's the original 310 EM. Mm -hmm. Also plan nine from outer space, John. I know that's one of your top yeah. 100 stuff. So, yeah. Absolutely. Well, and like, it's also should be noted, like throne of blood is a movie that wasn't revered as much as it is now until more recently when it was first released a lot of american critics said that it was kind of just like this like stale adaptation of shakespeare mm -hmm. that didn't work and look who's laughing now yeah i'm telling you <laughs> hey how many movies do that though how many movies yeah. are just really well received and then end up being you know not anymore or really badly received i mean just think about it like you know yeah. i think it was the year before this or the year after this was when around the world in 80 days won best picture so yeah whoops anyway um it's also right, John, in, it's also incredible that we can talk about this movie uh which is obviously like huge and we've talked about kurosawa and uh toshiro mafune but the fact that we can go half an hour talking about this movie without mentioning that takashi shimura's in it is incredible and which role is he uh he plays Oda, uh odagaru which is the um, kind of like the guy who takes Mike's son away, mm. like it helps him escape. Mm -hmm. But like, we're talking about Takashi Shimura. We're talking about again uh, one of uh, Kurosawa's greatest collaborators. Is in like almost all of Kurosawa's films, mm -hmm. and and the man who made Godzilla happen, right? Like, yeah, we're talking. Well, and about I thought it was interesting that this is a actor. Toho production. Yeah. I did think that was interesting that this was a Toho production. That really surprised me at the beginning. I really thought it was just going to pop up as Janice film. <laughs> yeah. But so. it, this film's incredible. If you haven't watched it, give it a watch. It's so worth it in every way. Yeah. 
All right. Well, before we jump over to Gladiator, John, what was the best thing you watched this week? Ooh, I watched a few good ones today. I uh, watched the Phantom Thread, which mm-hmm. is an incredibly underrated PTA film. I mean, we, I mean, how many consecutive weeks can we mention <laughs> mention the Phantom Thread at this point? I know but, we, we've really been on a heater here, <laughs> but it, it's a slow movie where not a lot happens. But it's some of the it's a beautiful film and some great character work, uh, possibly the greatest character work PTA has ever done. It's which is impressive because PTA has done a lot of incredible character work. Uh, but I actually have to give the best movie. I watched a different samurai movie this year, this week, and that was uh, 2010's uh, 13 Samurai by uh, Takashi Mika. Mika. Mm, mm. Uh, it's a remake. I remember, I kind of vaguely remembered it coming out. It's the one that's I actually called it, like 13 Assassins, right? Yeah, it's called 13 Assassins. It's, mm. it's a remake of a 1963 film, I believe. And 2010 is a weird year for a samurai movie to come out. Samurai mm-hmm. movies, people had said at this point, samurai movies don't work. Mm-hmm. And I mean, we saw that because there were a lot of like American remakes. This is like around the same time and, that a really bad, like 47 Ronin movie came out. And, and I mean, Tom Cruise tried to warn them all by making a movie called The Last Samurai. The Last Samurai. Yeah, Not exactly. Making samurai movies, guys. That one's but, actually pretty good if you haven't checked that one out. That's but what, a good movie. What Takashi Miike does in this film, it's incredible. This is one of the greatest samurai movies ever made, especially when you can like consider how late it's been made. The fact that it, this is this is Takashi Miike. This is the same guy who mm-hmm. made uh, Audition and mm-hmm. Ichi the Killer. Like <laughs> these are cult movies on their own, and he creates this movie in the vein of Kurosawa. That feels a lot like a Kurosawa film, but it still feels like a Miike film. Mm-hmm. It, it's it's a phenomenal watch. I probably would have never thought about it unless a friend mentioned it. And when they did, I just decided to watch it. And I'm so glad I did. He is uh, one of the most messed up directors to ever live. So, yeah. yeah. I'm not surprised that a movie called 13 Assassins by him was pretty good. Um, uh, I actually go Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Um it helps that I only watched two movies this week, and one of them was on Golden Pond, which what the <laughs> F was that? Uh, I just – I couldn't believe it because that movie has such critical acclaim. And I get it was Fonda and Hepburn, and it was at the end and whatever. Oh, my God. Take – what is it in, in Forgetting Sarah Marshall? Take me eyes, but don't take me shirt. Take me sh- – or take me eyes, please. Take me <laughs> eyes, but don't take me shirt because I just couldn't watch it. And the score for it might be the worst score I've ever heard in a movie – and I looked up and it was on AFI's top 25 scores of all time. And I was just like, what in the world? Go listen to it. You're going to wait. I, I was watching. I'm like, every time the score would start, I'm like, oh, here comes the commercial break. And then there's going to be a narrator who's going to say, we'll be back in just a few moments with the conclusion of on Golden Pond. And then we we're going to get, do you have arthritis? Here's how we can cure your arthritis. I know you don't get commercials <laughs> like that in Canada, but that's what I thought was going to happen because that's what this movie, this was a daytime soap opera bullshit. It was so bad. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, though, first time I've watched it probably since about 2001. I quite enjoyed it. Um, it go, it meanders for me a bit in the second half, and I still will never appreciate the martial arts stuff the way that I'm supposed to, so that's always going to be a knock. But I really enjoyed the story of this movie. Um, I thought it was a pretty cool idea, and some of the fight scenes when they weren't floating through the air were just amazing. And, like, these one-shot scenes – of people just beating the crap out of each other. Like those are real people really doing that. There's some really good stuff in that movie. Um, John, I purposely watched this one this week because we talked about almost famous last week. And now we're talking about gladiator this week, three movies that all came out in 2000 crouching tiger, hidden dragon beat gladiator for best score. That is a horrible decision. And now I'll get into this. I really personally like that style of music. I really do. Like in Hero, I thought it really worked. I told you about that. I, it was like relaxing, all that. But let's talk about Gladiator. Because Gladiator is my number 43. You have it up back there at 89 or something like that. This movie is one of, if not the best revenge stories ever told. And yes. I think that's why people love it. Critics don't love this movie. That is something that needs to be stated. Traffic should have won Best Picture, according to all the critics. And Traffic is a better version of Crash than Crash is of Crash. <laughs> I've seen traffic like four times. Traffic's okay. I haven't loved traffic. Steven Soderbergh is so hit or miss for me. And that's a, it's a meh. I really had high expectations for it. It doesn't do it for me. Benicio Del Toro, 
Woo, he's dope in that movie. And it makes sense he beat Joaquin Phoenix, although Joaquin Phoenix should have won. But, you know, Benicio del Toro was the first Spanish, fully Spanish yeah. role ever to win. But Gladiator clicks on all cylinders. You can nitpick the shit out of this story if you want to. How did this happen? How did that happen? It's not historically accurate. I don't care. I don't, I don't, that's not why I sat down to watch this movie. I didn't sit down to watch Gladiator to have a historically accurate movie. This movie just excels at being a revenge tale. Maximus's character is phenomenal. Commodus's character is phenomenal. F fantastic villain. Fantastic villain. Like just top notch. Mm -hmm. And the score to this movie makes you want to run through a brick wall as hard as you possibly can. It is such an amazing score, but it's like an inspirational score. It's one of those, like, you could listen to this before going out and playing a football game, and you're probably going to play really well because it's going to pump you up to go play that game. And it fits this movie so well because it also has the operatic moments and things like that. Mm -hmm. I just, this movie is one of those, every time I sit down and watch, I'm like, this is going to be the time that I finally admit I am overrating Gladiator. And then every time I sit down and watch it, I'm like, that is one of the most entertaining movies in the history of film that isn't stupid. Because there's so many entertaining movies that are just flat dumb when you actually start to break them down. This movie just works. Jaiman Hansu is great. Russell Crowe obviously wins the Oscar for it. He's great. Oliver Reed, who I didn't even know existed until I went and watched Oliver. I didn't know that was him. So good in this movie. This is his last role. If you want to find out how he died, go on Wikipedia. It's depressing as all hell. Died during the filming of this movie. Joaquin Phoenix, amazing. Connie Nielsen, amazing. Richard Harris, whispering as he always does. I just love it. I love the visuals. Mm -hmm. Ridley Scott's direction, which he doesn't win. Soderbergh ended up winning Best Director for this year, which I think is kind of crazy. Um, but it just, everything about this movie, I love. And I get to sit down and I can watch this movie all the time and never get tired of it. And uh, that's what I look for when I'm putting out, what are my favorite 100 movies? Is this actually a better movie than The Godfather Part 2? Probably not. But what am I more likely to watch again? This. I'm going to enjoy this more every time. And that's why I have Gladiator all the way up here. And why Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon can have its three other Oscars. It should not have won best score, John. Okay. I, I, I can give you that. I mean, the score is really good, except for the absolute last thing that happens in this movie. The score at the end of this movie is terrible. Why do you say that? It's like the uh, we're moving on. Inspirational yeah, getting out of here. It, it, it felt it felt bad. And I don't know. It no. didn't. It felt to me like it didn't fit the tone of the film at all. And I get it. <laughs> Gladiator, like you said, is this big revenge story. I think it's also this redemption story, though, mm -hmm. of like, yes, Maximus is driven by his revenge. I want to get back at Commodus, but at the same time, like. It's watching him do it. It's, it's that, and that's where the redemption comes, right? It's when I watched this film, I, I really felt like I looked at my top 100 and where I had placed it in, and I was like, yeah, this is about this is where I'm going to put this movie. This is the first rated R movie I ever saw in theaters. I saw this in theaters too. I was, I was eight, yeah. eight years old. Yep. Yeah. Um, and I, it stuck with me because of that. <laughs> and I look at it now, I'm like, how was this movie ever rated R? But yeah, there's not even like I was, I, I always, there's like no nudity in it. And yeah. there's, it's really not all that violent. There's like maybe no. one or two scenes, but even the gladiator scenes, you get the guy who's cut in half. I mean, that happens. Yeah. But for the most part, they're not overdoing the blood and gore the way I remember them overdoing the blood and gore. They really don't. And I think that also yeah. helps this movie though. I do too. I, I really think that like, <clears throat> I think this is still the best Ridley Scott has ever done for direction. Mm -hmm. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And the fact that he didn't beat Soderbergh is mind blowing. It's Ridley Scott's so hit or miss. It, it's very evident based on if you watch any of his movies, you'll be like, it's either this is a great movie or this is not a good movie. Mm -hmm. um, we had two of the not good movies this year. So, yeah, I had an average one and I'm never going to watch House of Gucci. So, you know, I'm yeah. just going to ignore that that ever existed. So, it, it's really interesting to see that, like, this is the height of a director working with. I mean, Russell Crowe gives the performance of his career in this movie. Mm -hmm. And Joaquin Phoenix, first off, looks like a baby in this movie. He does. He does. <laughs> it's very weird to see him as like a 25-year-old. Very weird. But the performance of Joaquin Phoenix in this film, mm -hmm. mind-blowing. Like, that performance alone 
makes this into a great movie. If people had heard of him before this movie, he would have won the Oscar. Benicio Del Toro is great. Like, Mm -hmm. in Traffic. He's the best part of Traffic. He's great. But if... The the thing working in Benicio Del Toro's favor is his repertoire up until that point. Joaquin Phoenix didn't have one. Joaquin Mm -hmm. Phoenix was pretty much an unknown at this point. And he was so overshadowed by Russell Crowe because he's the villain. This was also at a time where the Oscars weren't really comfortable yet giving the Oscar to the villain every time. We see it with Verbal Kent a couple years earlier. But a lot of times supporting actor was still going. Michael Caine wins supporting actor for the Cider House Rules, beating out Tom Cruise from Magnolia and um, I forget who else in 99. So the year before. They were still in like a feel-good moment. They wanted it to be the hero who was still going to win this award. This wasn't at the Anton Shakur days or whatever. It's yeah. sugar. It wasn't at that point yet. We hadn't gotten there. And so I think that's where this gave the advantage to Benicio Del Toro. But Joaquin Phoenix in this movie is downright terrifying. He is he makes you uncomfortable the whole time. You know he can do anything. It's very, very terrifying. But he does it so well. And it just it's yeah. not surprising to think that 22 years later, he's one of the best actors in Hollywood. No, and, and like we saw it then. And I, I do remember people kind of acknowledging Joaquin Phoenix then. And then he kind of like went to the wayside a little bit because he did signs afterwards. Uh, signs was well, it wasn't signs, John. I know you don't like signs. It wasn't signs. It was, he started doing movies like Ladder 49. Oh, uh, yes, shit Ladder like 49. I forgot about that movie. That was it. Because signs actually made quite a bit of money. Yeah. So people, okay, who is this guy? But he did, I, I'm trying to get it to load, but Letterboxd is being a monster right now. Um, it, it was like, he did a string of, I'm going to win an Oscar movies. Right. And it was like, well, why are you, why are you doing that? I don't, I don't understand what you're doing. So I think that's where it was a bigger deal. Yeah, then he started working with Paul Thomas Anderson, and uh, we're going to talk about that later. Yeah, we'll talk later. about that later. Oh. That's when he started being good. Um, yeah. Well, Walk the Line was really what launched him. Mm-hmm. Like, let's be real. That was when it was, okay, you know what? He can do this. Um, he did The Village. Ladder 49, Hotel Rwanda, and The Village. Obviously, Hotel Rwanda is a good movie. But Ladder 49 and The Village both came out in 2004, and I think that's when it was like, uh-oh. And then he did Walk the Line. That got him some credibility. Then he didn't really do much after Walk the Line. He was pretty quiet until The Master. The so, Master. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but to, to think we have these two outstanding performances in this film. And even the supporting cast in this film gives incredible performances. Like, you talk about how Richard Harris just, like, whispers the entire time. It works so well for his character. Yeah, in this he's movie. dying. He's, he's <laughs> dying. He's on his deathbed. And just, like... He realizes that as long as there is an emperor for the Roman Empire and Rome is not a republic, war is going to be perpetual. And to have that type of wise character on his deathbed, just like realizing like the error of his ways and what he needs to do in order to make everything better, but knows he doesn't have time to do it. Richard Harris plays it in such a fantastic way where you feel that connection between him and Maximus. This like father-son connection that he doesn't have with Commodus. And it really does help set up the entire film. Yeah. He's a uh, he's a really good actor. And like he did mm-hmm. so much towards the end of his career. You think this, the Count of Monte Cristo, Harry Potter. He was doing all that stuff at the end. And like a lot of those roles are really what he's best known for at this point. But like I agree. The supporting cast in this is great. Jaiman Hansu plays that role so well. I don't know what the big German guy's name is, but he is so good in this movie. The guy who plays uh, Cicero, very good. Looks just like the guy who plays uh, whatever his name is in Braveheart, even though they're not the same actor. I looked it up. Couldn't believe it. Um, but they all look very – like they all just fit their roles. And I think a lot of that comes down again to like the costuming and the makeup and all that. And just Ridley Scott really knowing how to like just get you into a world. Like he gives you those title cards at the beginning and then he says, okay, here's the first battle and let's see what our character's good at. And we talked about exposition with Throne of Blood. Think about the exposition in this movie. It is, this is like a masterclass in how to give us every motivation of your protagonist, but make it all feel natural. He goes out there, he tells, he beats the crap out of everybody, tells them I'm going to be on my, you know, thing with my family. And if you get there, whatever. Wins the battle, 
does so because he's very good at what he does. He's a great general. And then the guy says, what can I give you? I just want to go home. Boom. Every time you take any screenwriting class, they're going to say to you, what does your character want? Our, our audience isn't going to care if we don't know what your protagonist wants. What does your protagonist want? My protagonist, what do you want? They ask you the question five minutes into this movie and he tells you and you're like, get this man home. Like, let's go. Yeah. And then we see all of the manipulation around that, how they're trying to keep him. Joaquin Phoenix, I'm going to, I'm going to come to you. Don't get too comfortable. I'm going to come to you. The, you know, Richard Harris wanting him to go and become his successor, all of this stuff. And all this guy wants to do is go home. And then his home is taken from him. So what is he doing? All he wants is revenge. It's perfect setup. It is just perfect setup. It's a great screenplay. And it just it just tells you everything you need to know right away. And it goes. And it's not doing it in an overly heavy-handed way. It could have, but it's not. And those lines that might seem like over-the-top exposition, you just won a major battle against a bunch of people that you consider a barbarian. And somebody said to you, what do you want? Because they should, because you're the general of the army that just won the war. You should tell them what you want. You shouldn't speak in something crazy and abstract. And I say that a lot, but so often people are so scared of cliches and like the screenwriting mentality that they won't just have the character answer a question like a normal person would answer a question. And that makes it stupid. Yeah. I love that I know what Commodus wants or that uh, Maximus, what he wants. Because as soon as I know what Maximus wants and as soon as that is taken from him permanently, I know that the rest of this movie, all he wants to do is kill the person who did that. And sure enough, he works his way up. It it just works. It just really does. And yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and that opening sequence, I mean, I I had to watch the extended version because for some reason, every single streaming service in Canada removed this movie from it in the last two weeks. Censorship, John. They make it 16 minutes longer out of censorship. I know. So, so I, I had to watch the extended version. It doesn't add too much, which is nice. Um, but like this opening sequence really does establish everything we need to know about Maximus's character so well. It shows how brilliant of a tactician he is, how revered he is by his men, yeah. and how battle-hardened and wary he is. And, like, him being so weary is, like, the, the big thing here. It's like, he mm -hmm. has been doing this a long time at this point, and he just wants to go home. Yeah. And I think, I think... You know, what we think about now with wars, like obviously America has been in what the war in our Iraq for what a thousand years. Um, but so often you think about like a war happens and then it's gone. And a lot of times when you look through history, it'll be like, oh, you know, our civil war, 1861 to 1865. Mm -hmm. That's not when that war ended. That might be when it no. was signed to end. But that's not when everybody was just like, great, we're back to life. Let's go. Let's go have a great Christmas this year. Like, that's not what happens. It's the same thing right now. We feel like we might be out of COVID. Or whatever it is. That doesn't necessarily mean everything's just gone back to normal, normal, yeah. normal. And when you hear that this guy's been away for two years, 300 days, and whatever as of this morning. You know, whatever he says. This isn't 2022 where, well, I haven't been home in two years, but I'm just going to text him, call him, see what's going on. Yeah, It's a long time. to And for the only thing you want to be away from that. And to be as exhausted as, he's, as he is, and you know, like with the with the history of the Roman Empire, how it was just, let's take everybody down. Let's make it mm -hmm. our own. And we are going to take over the whole world. There wasn't going to be any rest until they did. That's what, you know, really, uh, it, it just, this Maximus character is just great. It, it, mm -hmm. He really is one of the best heroes in film history. And, and that's what makes this movie so good. Because you care about him. You care about what he's doing. Russell Crowe plays the part fantastically. And that's it. Yeah, and, and when we're talking about Maximus's character, it's just, it's just so interesting to see him go from this, like, very noble leader of the army and then to have him, like, sold into slavery to become a gladiator in the first place and then kind of just, like, refuse to do anything for the first mm -hmm. little while. And, again, that plays on, like, the weariness, but also just this idea that he I mean, he's lost everything he had to live for. And he's fought real wars. He doesn't need to go fight a fake war. Exactly. I mean, he knows, he knows if he does fight back, every single person is going to die. Mm -hmm. Like He, he knows what he's capable of and he chooses that restraint. And I think that's what really helps build him as this heroic character rather than, you know, rather than a character like, uh, if we look into like more recent films, like John Wick, which is also a revenge yeah. story. Like the difference in those, these, these type of revenge stories all comes down to that protagonist. 
Yeah, and and with this one, like we see it, he's doing what he has to do to get back to his family. And then he goes back to his family and that's where he's picked up by the African, uh, you know, the people coming from Africa and they're, you know, he's sold into slavery and we see then it's, it, he doesn't have a bloodlust. And I think that's, what's important. Mm -hmm. There is no bloodlust for Maximus. Maximus kills because he has to, I think he even says that at one point where it's like, yeah, that's what my job is. Something like along those lines. But, um, I really like how we watch him go through this and evolve to the point where like you guys want bloodlust and it leads to that great moment of, are you not entertained? Like one of the best lines ever yeah. when he's just screaming that after killing everybody almost immediately. And it's that, that idea of like, this is what entertains you. You like watching other people kill each other. I'm not here to to entertain you. I'm here to just do what I have to do so I can continue to live so I can keep moving forward. And then we see him take the general approach once he actually does get into the Colosseum, where now he's taking down the enemy because he has to take down the enemy. He doesn't have a choice, and he's just going to keep him and his people as safe as possible. That's what it comes down to. And uh, I do like that we are given the hope for Maximus, that he's going to get out of this, that he's going to get there and he's going to take down all that. At the end of the day, this movie ends perfectly. It needs to end the way it does. There is no life for Maximus after this is over. There can't be. He has to die. There is no way that he can live past this. Him and the emperor having their, having their battle is fantastic. That's what needs to happen because everything else working out for him would have just been like, Oh, now we're getting into like a politics movie. No, it is all about this. He gets his revenge and he ultimately gets what he wants, which is to go home to the family. So I just think like it's, it's a fantastically paced movie. I mean, you could argue the first hour, after the fight scene, it does take a bit before he's actually like gladiating, if you will. Um, but but like it takes a little bit to get to that point. But I'm fine with that because that to me is just it's just world building. Like to me, it didn't feel too long. Um, but I could see some people saying that after that, though, the pacing for that whole last hour and a half is ridiculous. Like it just flies by and and everybody everybody's got their motivations and they spend the right amount of time with each character just to let us know what the stakes really are for everybody. I forgot how early in the film Maximus's identity is revealed. I did too. I forget that it's like he's it's revealed before the midway point, I think, or right at the midway point. Right at the midway point. And I mean that that line of father of a murdered son, mm-hmm. father or husband of a murdered wife. Um it just keeps going. It just I keeps going. I can't remember I can't, how I'll be that I can't good. Remember. But it's such a powerful line there and like you can see it on Commodus's face he wants to murder him so bad right then and there but he knows he can't he would lose the people oh and that's what i really love about the conflict in this film is that we we get it a lot when Commodus is like talking to people it's like what do i do and people are just like just kill him and he's like i can't do that Mm -hmm. i can't just kill him i have to put him in situations where somebody defeats him because if I don't, none of these people are going to stick with me. And having him get to this point where, you know, eventually his ego does control him. And he does get to the point where he's like, oh, people are saying that Maximus is the, the liberator of Rome. Yeah, yeah. So now I have to deal with him. But at that point, like, all he wanted to do was prevent Maximus from becoming a martyr. But... And it didn't... There was he, nothing he could do. There's yeah, nothing he, he can do. He, he didn't deal with it soon enough, so that he made him a martyr. And he would have never been a martyr if he would have just let the line of secession go the way that the father wanted it to. Um, so we, we, we're we obviously coming off the Oscars here. I just think it's interesting to look at uh, Gladiator and kind of where it lines up with other movies of the genre. Mm-hmm. Because I really believe, and I know Oscar, I don't know when the term Oscar bait was deemed. I'm going to assume the eighties because the eighties had a lot of really bad Oscar best picture winners, but I feel like most people associate the nineties and the early two thousands with like what Oscar bait is. And I'm talking like movies like dances with wolves, the English patient, Braveheart. What's so fascinating to me is if you look at the nineties and you could pretty much do this for any decade when it comes to best picture winners, very similar movies tend to be winning best picture. Look at the 80s. Even though those movies might not have anything in common, a lot of them are biopics. Mm -hmm. Gandhi, 
Amadeus, Out of Africa. Those are all biopics, like all of them. Yeah. And if you look at the 90s, a lot of this was like this like Western-ish type thing. Dances with Wolves, Unforgiven. Even though it's not a Western, it's still set in like a, a, a open landscape. The English Patient, Braveheart. Like these, these, it was all about what's the visual look like? What is mm -hmm. everything that's going on there? And then you'd have every now and then you'd have, you know, your Shakespeare in Love, which again, I still think that comes down a lot to visual for some people being where it was. Um, Titanic, visual heavy. And then you get a movie like Gladiator. And Gladiator comes right at the tail end of all of this. It's very similar to Braveheart, but much more interesting, in my opinion, than Braveheart. I still like Braveheart quite a bit, but it's much more interesting. But once Gladiator won, if you look at the movies that start to win Best Picture from there, it's almost like Gladiator hurt the Lord of the Rings first two movies because Gladiator won. Now it had to be, we got to start going to these other, A Beautiful Mind, Tyson Chicago, movie. something different. And the third one wins and there was no way it wasn't going to win. That was just more of anything else. But then you get Million Dollar Baby, another like pure drama and crash. And so it's always funny to me to think of like, what does Oscar bait mean? Because people will throw out Oscar bait all the time. I see like the top reviewed, the top review for Belfast is, uh, a computer simulation sat down and watched a hundred best picture winners. And this is what it produced. And I thought that was very funny because it does have that feel, but at the same yeah. time, that's not an Oscar bait movie in 1990. No. Just like gladiator is not an Oscar bait movie. It just happened to come at the end of a lot of movies that were similar to it. And then come out before a lot of movies that started to do it. One could argue better or when Ridley Scott tries to come out with Robin hood. And makes a steaming pile of shit. Like we see that a lot with with this moving forward, where people are trying to kind of rep replicate Gladiator. Gladiator, I think, kind of survives and is still pretty well revered. Whereas, like you know, the English Patient, everybody hates it, even if they haven't seen it. Uh, Braveheart, most people hate it. I don't know if that's just because Mel Gibson's in it or because they don't like the movie. Dances with Wolves, same thing. Kevin Costner. How do people feel about him? I don't know. I think he's still talking at the Oscars. Though, uh, so I'm maybe. pretty sure Dances with Wolves is more of like the like weight savior aspect of it is why people don't like it anymore. I guess, but also I always look at it this way. Like it's set in like 1866. The white savior thing was going on in 1866. I so you know. can like, you know, that that's happening. So, but, but all of that is to say, I just think it's fun to look at like where a movie like Gladiator lands and how well received it still is and how unbelievably popular this movie is. This is an unbelievably popular movie. I understand it's got Ridley Scott and Russell Crowe who are massive, massive names, but it didn't have to be unbelievably popular. It could have fallen to the wayside over time and it really hasn't. Critics might not love it, but regular movie going fans love it. I was looking at IMDb. I think it's like number 50 movie of all time or something like that. Like Damn. it's way up there. It's good. Letterboxd. People love it on Letterboxd. It's a movie that people really still relate to. Despite the fact that there's some who, if they were to watch this movie now might say that's an Oscar bait movie, but what actually is Oscar bait? Is it just as soon as a movie of a genre or something wins an Oscar? Now it is any movie that tries to follow that is Oscar bait because It's just fun to see how Gladiator really set the tone for this type of like period piece action revenge movie and how we have not seen anything come close to it since, even though we had arguably four movies in the 90s that did it and one yeah. best picture were nominated. It's very weird. Yeah, I just, I it, it's that. really interesting to kind of see those trends when it comes to to awards and everything like that. I also think Gladiator kind of ruined Ridley Scott's career. Yeah. He can Because, never touch it again. No, it, it was such a it's it's such a well-made movie that like like from a visual standpoint, I it just the different scenes we're seeing like the the opening sequence of like the battle against the Germanic tribes and everything up like in that Gaul region, we see like the Spanish countryside and then we get like the Roman Colosseum and everything. He creates just these wonderful encapsulations of these environments that make them so drastically different from each other and so distinct mm -hmm. that it looks phenomenal. He has incredible acting and it's a very compelling story. But how many times has Ridley Scott tried to remake this movie? Kingdom of Heaven, Robin Hood, that terrible Exodus movie, Gods and Kings or whatever. Yeah, he just never gets there again.
the last I mean, Black one, Hawk like, Down comes out the year after this, and that's a great movie. But yeah. it's crazy to think like that those came out so close, but he never comes to this level again. No, and, like and he just it always feels like whenever Ridley Scott releases movies, it always feels like he's either trying to recreate Alien or recreate Gladiator. And I think it's really hurt his career because those movies are just so iconic at this point. Yeah, I agree. I totally, totally agree. And I mean, The Martian, you know, was a recreation kind of of Alien, but I don't know. I think The Martian is super overrated. I really don't like that movie. <laughs> I think it's very, very overrated. Um, yeah, I just, I just think it's, it's, it's fun sometimes to look at like where does this land in film history and what's it coming on the heels of and all of that. When you think about it, and it leads to a beautiful mind the next year winning Best Picture, which yep. I think is a, one of the biggest jokes of all time. But and it beats the first Lord of the Rings. Yep. I mean, how much of that just had to do with how hot Russell Crowe was at the time? And really, Scott gets a direction nomination for Black Hawk Down, even though the movie doesn't get nominated. It's amazing what you can do, like when you when you're coming off an Oscar, though, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just I, I think Alien and this, I'd still probably put this above Alien, but those are I think those are two Ridley Scott's two best movies by a lot. I don't yeah, even think I it's agree. close. And I really hate Blade Runner, so that's also why. So, yeah, and, no, I agree. Well, that was fun. I hope everybody mm -hmm. enjoyed my little tirade there at the end about the 90s Oscars. But I just think it's fun to see, like, we saw the same movie come out five years earlier, except this one's set yeah. in a gladiator arena. Think about how inspirational though this movie was. Think about mm -hmm. the uh, Spartacus TV show that came out on Stars, which if you haven't yeah. watched it, it is freaking amazing. It's so fun to watch. Think about Game of Thrones. And the, and the scenes with Danny in the Coliseum and how yep. inspired they are by this. There's so much. And obviously this is pulling inspiration from like Ben-Hur and things like that, even though Ben-Hur was, you know, just this, this scope. Yeah. Ben-Hur is more of the chariot races, but it's still the scope and all that. But just think about the inspiration that came off of this movie. That's how you know this movie is amazing. People we, who will really, say that they don't like this movie are still trying to replicate it. That's how good this movie yeah. is. Yeah. Like we, we really see – we saw this kind of resurgence for this historical revenge plot at this time. And like, arguably we just saw like this resurgence of like revenge plots in general at this time. Mm -hmm. But there was like this big instance of like taking a revenge plot and putting it somewhere at a different time period. Right. Like mm -hmm. we talked about how Ridley Scott did it a lot with like kingdom of heaven and Robin hood. Um, you mentioned like game of Thrones. Uh, and then we, we had that resurgence of kind of like that Roman aesthetic for a long time mm -hmm. too, with things like 300, and like you said, Spartacus or, you know, HBO's Rome. We had Troy. Yeah. Like we had a lot of movies that happened in this like ancient time period around this turn of the century. And Gladiator is kind of the reason why. Yeah. Yeah. For better or for worse. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, next week we are going to be moving on to our number 42 movies of all time. And uh, John's is Mad Max Fury Road from 2015. So the one that came out uh, just a couple of years ago. Crazy to think that movie's seven years old already. Seven that years old now. <laughs> makes me sad. And Adaptation from 2002, the uh, the Charlie Kaufman written Spike Jones directed movie. This is my second movie from 2002. Um, the hours I had earlier, but it's not my favorite because we have the pianist coming up soon. So. Yeah, Adaptation 2002 and Mad Max Fury Road 2015. Two very different movies, for sure, but two movies that are still modern, so I think it'll be fun to talk about mm -hmm. those. And, um, yeah, that's all we got. I hope you're all enjoying this. And uh, after that, we have The Evil Dead and Breaking Away. So two movies that came out two years apart and couldn't be further apart. So um, we'll talk about all those when we get there, but hope you're all enjoying it. Hope you enjoyed this discussion of Gladiator and Throne of Blood. Hopefully you all go listen to the soundtrack to Gladiator. And if you do listen to the soundtrack for Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Do so without the headphones in and just make sure the music's playing through the headphones that you don't have touching your ears. All right, I'm out. I just wanted to throw that at John one more time so he can text me and say, Phil, it's actually a pretty good score. But anyway, I get the 